symbol of public faith, ethics to police service, sanctity of life, all of this matters tremendously to this case because you will learn that on May 25th of 2020, Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd. Welcome back to Court TV. It is time for a Friday edition of the Daily Sidebar. And today's lucky contestants or guests are Chanley Painter, live from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Michael Ayala, Court TV anchor. Thank you both. Um, so let's do this. We're going to go through some subject matter, some themes that both sides tried to get across to the jury, and some themes that were very important in this case. We'll start with use of force. Um, and we're going to play a bit from Jerry Blackwell and Lieutenant Zimmerman, and then we're going to talk about who ended up winning this uh, use of force angle uh, in this case. Here we go. What you're going to see and learn a lot about is what is the standard for applying force against individuals, the use of force policy. You learn that Minneapolis Police Department employees shall only use the amount of force that is objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances the force used shall be consistent with current Minneapolis Police Department training. What you learn, ladies and gentlemen, is that the use of force must be evaluated from one moment to the next moment, from moment to moment. What may be reasonable in the first minute may not be reasonable in the second minute, the fourth minute, or the ninth minute and 29 seconds. Pulling him down to the ground, face down, and putting your knee on the neck for that amount of, uh, that amount of time is just um, uncalled for. Um, it, I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger, if that's what they felt. Um, and that's what they would have to feel to be able to use that kind of force. Uh, so, in your opinion, should that restraint have stopped once he was handcuffed and prone on the ground? Absolutely. All right, Charlie Painter, use of force. Talk, what stood out to you in terms of themes that hit home um, for either side? Well, uh, first of all, there were many, many witnesses on the side of the prosecution to the one defense expert. I know that we only had two experts for the prosecution, Ted, technically for use of force, but also we had the high-ranking Minneapolis police officers taking the stand also denouncing what Derek Chauvin did. So I think cumulatively that was quite effective. Of course, we know the prosecution carries the burden in the case. It's a heavy burden, so they're going to put all the evidence on they can. But then we have the one expert from the defense side who on cross-examination was you know, held his feet to the fire and he said some things that I think maybe undercut his credibility a little bit. He kind of lost me when he said that George Floyd was resting comfortably on the ground. From then on, it's kind of almost like uh, you kind of shut him out a little bit on that end. But I think it just shows that this defense has to focus more on the cause of death issue than the reasonableness of that use of force. Michael? Well, Chanley's being nice because the, <laughs> the, the defense expert was a mess, straight up, so we don't even have to deal with that. Um, as far as the um, uh, use of force issue, uh, for me, what stands out is that four minutes and 44 seconds. I mean, I think up until that point where George Floyd is non-responsive, um, you could make an argument that, okay, there needed to be some intervention by the police, and I think you would, it would be hard for a jury to put themselves into the shoes of an officer and say the things that they were doing then were unreasonable, right? It, that's a, a fluid term, and uh, it's hard to, again, as a juror, say, oh, I'm going to make a different decision at, of, as you, because you were at the scene. But once he's unresponsive, the duty of care, and I thought the prosecution did a great job in opening statements talking about the duty of care and the, what the badge means and taking care of humanity, all those things, once that four minutes and 44 seconds begins and nothing is done, that's what stands out to me. That's our next topic, duty of care. The fact that Chauvin or the other officers did not render aid once they all determined that he was passed out. They talked about it. You heard it on the body cameras. Um, uh, Lane or, or, or King says, I think he just passed out. They knew he was passed out and no care was given. Let's hear from uh, Jerry Blackwell about that. When Mr. Floyd was in distress, 
Mr. Chauvin wouldn't help him, didn't help him. But you're also going to see that he stopped everybody else from being able to help him. You will learn that amongst the bystanders was a first responder, a member of the Minneapolis uh, Fire Department who was trained in administering first aid and emergency care. She's going to come and talk with you. Her name is Genevieve Hansen. She wanted to check his pulse. She wanted to check on Mr. Floyd's well-being. She wanted him to let up and get up. She did her best to intervene, to be able to act, to intercede on George Floyd's behalf, and you'll be able to see for yourself when she approached Mr. Chauvin on top of George Floyd with both of his knees, reached for his mace in his belt, and pointed in her direction. Did you see the defendant uh, or any of the officers attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd? I did not see any of the defendants try to attempt to provide first aid to Mr. Floyd. The defendant did not try CPR. He did not start chest compressions. Objection, argumentative, and Sustain is leading, rephrase. Did you see them prov did you see them provide any medical attention? I did not. Generally, this was a theme that before trial, I really didn't think too much about. I just thought about, why well, get your knee off, get your knee off. But technically, and the, the prosecution's argument is, yeah, knee was the first step, then it was CPR. Exactly. Even the defense's own medical expert, Dr. Fowler, said on cross-examination that first aid should have been rendered when he was when George Floyd was unconscious. And I think Michael's right that last four minutes of when George Floyd isn't resisting, he's unconscious. That's going to be almost insurmountable insurmountable for the defense to overcome and I'm not sure that vociferous crowd defense is going to be enough to overcome that. That's why I think they really need to harp on the causation of death, other causes and the theory of the case for the closing argument. Michael? Yeah, he's trying to overcome it. The defense, that is, is trying to overcome that four minutes and 44 seconds in a few ways. First way is the crowd, right? They're saying the crowd uh, was uh, causing fear in the officers. They couldn't focus on the duty of care. Number two, they're saying the actual, during that four minutes and 44 seconds, they actually de-escalated the use of force because they wanted to hobble George Floyd, but decided not to and thought better of it because they knew medics were on the way. And if they kept him down in the prone position, it would be easier for them to treat him once they arrived. And then they can't control how long it took for the paramedics to get there. So again, they're making reasonable choices there based on the actions of the crowd, based on what they knew at the scene at the time. That's the best hope for this defense because at the end of the day, again, you just want this jury to have to put themselves in the shoes of the officer officer at the scene. Always a tough thing for a jury to do. I can't stress that enough. All right, let's talk about cause of death. The big issue, the one that Chanley thinks this defense should harp on and stay on during the close. Let's listen to Eric Nelson and the defense expert. This will ultimately be another significant battle in this trial. What was Mr. Floyd's actual cause of death? The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia, that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body, all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. How would you classify the manner of death? So this is one of those cases where you have so many conflicting um, different manners. The carbon monoxide would usually be classified as an accident, although somebody was holding him there. So some people would say you could elevate that to a homicide. You've got um, the drugs on board. In most circumstances, in most um, jurisdictions, and drug intoxication would be considered to be an accident. He's got significant natural disease, certainly the heart, the paraganglionoma, you know, you can certainly consider it um, as a potential exacerbating process, but I wouldn't put it at the top of the list there. So he's got a mixture of that. Um, and then he's, he's in a situation where he's been restrained in a very stressful situation. And that in 
increased his fight and flight type reaction, and that would, during restraint, would be considered a homicide. And you put all of those together, it's very difficult to say which of those is the most accurate. So I would fall back to undetermined. Undetermined means um, that's a reasonable doubt, Chanley. Exactly. I think that's the best way for this defense to argue that in closing is it only takes one juror. We, we know this as attorneys. And that's the way I think they could do it is with this expert saying it's, he couldn't determine the cause of death because of all of these factors, plus the defense in their case in chief pointing back at the 2019 arrest, the similarities of the 2019 arrest to the 2020 arrest. We had Shawanda Hill on the stand talking about Floyd falling asleep in the car, going towards the defense theory of the case that this might have been a drug intoxication or an overdose death. Again, step by step, I think that's going to be the best avenue for the defense in closing. Michael, say what you want about the use of force expert. Dr. Fowler, when you take into account his C which was massive, um, he was a legitimate witness. He was legitimate. He was a good witness, a strong witness. He brought pertinent information. His testimony was helpful, very helpful to the defense. But as we said from the very beginning, this was going to be a battle of the experts over this cause of death. And when you have the experts on one hand, you have Dr. Fowler. Now, you have five or six on the side of the prosecution. But at the end of the day, it boils down to just one, Dr. Martin Tobin. And the images that I'm left with from this trial is from his testimony. We know that jurors are visual learners. They like visual aids. He used visual aids. He took us through uh, animations. He took us through step by step with the video and what Floyd was doing. The image in my mind from his testimony is Floyd's fingers on the ground trying to find space to breathe. His fingers on the wheel trying to find space to breathe. Space to breathe. That's what I remember. So when I'm going into that jury room, when I'm talking about battle of the experts, I say Tobin is the winner, and I think that bodes well for the prosecution. All right. That'll bring the week's end, the final uh, edition of this week for the Daily Sidebar. We Cyber. can't do it this weekend? You don't want to come in and do a couple? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come in? We'll see if we I'm show in. up. <laughs> Thank you both. Appreciate it. We're going to step aside take a break. When we come back, the outside influences outside the courthouse, <clears throat> how will they affect, if at all, the jury? talk about that next.